no Mickey show. Clash momentarily for class solidarity. Cash circulating, give the masses back its currency. Greed from elites, oligarchs, stay fed. Deep state, faith fed. Everybody break bread. Racism, homophobia, sexism, religion in this melted pot. We live in time to build a new system. Unionize labor rights. Highlight the issue. Talking heads left is best. The saga continues. Continues. The No Miki Show. Hello and welcome to the Nomi Key Show. It is Wednesday, August 4th. It is a very, very hot day here on my side of the planet. Wherever you are, I hope you are staying cool and you are safe. Uh, we are surrounded by forest fires, wildfires, of course, that have just engulfed uh, the, the the Mediterranean area. Um, and uh, a few years ago, it reminds me of driving through Greece and actually being caught in the middle of a wildfire, not really understanding including the firefighters not really understanding how significant the the wildfire was that took uh, over well over a hundred lives. And this is now the new norm. That was really unusual three years ago when driving through and I was very safe. Thank goodness. I found um, a place to stay, uh, but not everybody had that luck. And now we're seeing these images of people fleeing their homes on a moment's notice. We've seen these images Every single year, whether it's California or Italy or Turkey or Greece or France uh, or the the, the Southwest or Australia, we have seen these images. And this is all a result of climate change. And climate change, of course, is a result of a greater dysfunction in our society, dysfunction in which our leadership and our lawmakers, uh, if we live in a some sort of form of a functional democracy, are not responding to the crises at hand. Um, Of course, we have the crises of the pandemic in which, you know, a small minority is basically hijacking the public safety of of an entire globe. And government is doing what they can. And of course, they've they've been slow to respond in many cases, but but even worse, they've been trustworthy. (laughs) They've been trusting uh, the people to do what's right. At the end of the day, our lawmakers have taught us not to behave like a community. If we had values of of community, you know, taking care of our neighbors, taking care of our loved ones, perhaps this would have gone a different way. Um, That's why I think so many of us are democratic socialists, is that we believe that the community, democracy, taking care of each other, the well-being of our sisters and brothers, um, the most vulnerable in society, is what makes us stronger. You know, maybe. Some folks don't care about, uh, you know, poor people having access to housing or being evicted, but they sure do care when there are people in this country who don't have access to the vaccine. But it doesn't go one way or the other because, of course, that affects their immediate livelihoods. This is about taking care of everyone all the time, making sure that people are not suffering. Now, we're having these conversations almost, in my opinion, too late in the game. We saw an election yesterday of uh, Nina Turner versus versus Chantel Brown running for Congress. And a lot of people had hopes on Nina Turner, hoping that we would get one more squad member. Fortunately, we're not winning enough seats fast enough to react to these crises. And this is my fear. So today's show is really focused on, are we moving fast enough? for, to save us essentially, to save us from climate change, to save us from mass evictions and an economy spiraling out of control, even worse than we're even aware of. Are we prepared? Are we moving fast enough as progressives uh, so that we can respond to the next pandemic? I mean, I don't know if you guys saw, but there were articles out about the plague, like the actual, the OG plague spreading. Are we prepared for the plague? Are we prepared for the Delta plus variant? Of course we're not. And part of that is because we have been beholden and hijacked by conservatives. And and of course, in our country, and every country is different, but in our country, the Democratic Party has been clinging onto power for so long because they're so concerned about their contracts and their power and their fifth or sixth homes that they won't let progressives win any more seats. And what happens? Cori Bush, AOC, and Jimmy Gomez, and Mondaire Jones, they have to literally park themselves and sleep overnight in front of the Capitol to get the attention of the President of the United States and the CDC to extend an eviction moratorium. An eviction moratorium. They know this crisis is on is happening right now. 
They know we've been here before. We had Hoovervilles. Do you think that's a good look for Joe Biden? No, but they needed a couple of members of the squad, not even all of the members of the squad. They needed a couple of the members of the squad to literally not leave the Capitol steps and bring in leaders like Reverend Barber and the press to call attention to the fact that people are about to be kicked out of their homes because they can't pay for their rent because of a pandemic, because of forced lockdown, a needed lockdown. And our lawmakers can't even respond to that when with one signature, they could clear out all that debt and make sure that every single American has a place to stay, is not in danger of losing their homes because of this pandemic. That is how weak our lawmakers are right now in the United States of America. They won't let us have one more squad member. They are going to fight because God forbid we get another win. Problem is, when society fails, when government fails and they're in charge, they're going to be held responsible. But the alternative is a far right wing, which is only going to send us deeper and deeper and deeper down the hole. So the theme of the show today is about the fall of an empire. Seriously, I mean, we, we, we hear, we've heard it over and over and over again that America's in decline, society's in decline. I don't think this is about another superpower rising up. I think we are really on decline as, as humanity is on decline. This isn't just about the fall of the Roman Empire, but our first guest today is Professor Edward Watts, and he's going to be talking about his new his book, The Eternal Decline, and Fall of Rome, The History of a Dangerous Idea. Uh, it is a book out by Oxford University Press. We're going to be talking about what were the signs back then, what were the debates back then, and uh, was there any way to stop the decline of the Roman Empire? And what are the comparisons, obviously, to the decline of the U.S. Empire? And is there another superpower that could pop up? My thought is, and I think so many others who are in our age group, is that no, the alternative is climate change. The city that I'm in right now is literally surrounded by fires. At what point do you say, oh, okay, this might be too far? Because nothing seems to be clicking. And I'm very curious to see if when Rome was falling, people could not catch up because, you know, we're, 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 we're desensitized. We're also conditioned to these crises now, but it doesn't seem like it's enough for people to understand it's time to change strategies. It's time to stop with the old game. The, the, the least we could do, the least we could do is shift the way that we run elections. That's the least we could do. But clearly, we're not in solidarity enough on the left to be able to fight off the Democrats, the, 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 the centrist establishment Democrats who've been in power. And the centrist establishment Democrats who've been in power don't seem to see the crisis big enough to want to work with the left, which they need to stay in power. Because when they fail, and they will, and they have been, the far right, the scary far right, the populist far right is likely to rise into power again. Uh, so this is the show today. It is about what it, what it means when an empire collapses. Uh, so we have Edward Watts on today to talk about his show, his uh, new book. And then later we have Matthew Cunningham Cook from The Intercept to talk about uh, Senator Nina Turner's shocking loss yesterday uh, in Ohio for her congressional bid. And then later we have Napoleon the Legend and Julia Doubleday to talk about the pandemic, to talk about uh, Nina's race, of course. Uh, we're going to be talking about other news of the day. It's 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 been a crazy news week. Uh, we haven't even touched like on the Cuomo scandal at all, but we will be getting to that. So stick around. We will be back pretty soon, uh, very quickly to discuss the fall of the Roman Empire and maybe the U.S. Empire. Welcome back to the Nomi Key Show. Uh, Edward J. Watts is the author of The Eternal Decline and Fall of Rome, The History of a Dangerous Idea. He is also... The, okay, I got to get this right, and I'm Greek, so it's going it's to be embarrassing if I don't. 
uh, Alcaviades Vasiliadis, endowed chair and professor of history at the University of California in uh, San Diego. He has authored many books uh, from Mortal Republic, How Rome Fell into Tyr Tyranny, and uh, oh my gosh, City and School in Late, late Antique. Athens and Alexandria, so many different books. You can go check them out. We'll put a list up on, on uh, the site. But most importantly, I think I'm just going to start with the basic question, Professor Watts. Is this, are, are we seeing, like everyone's using this analogy and they've been doing it for, for a long time. Are we, is there similarity between the decline of Rome and the decline of uh, America? Yeah, well, America. first, thank you for, for having me here. This is really wonderful. And it's it's so wonderful to be able to, to talk and think about these ideas at this point. Um, I think to answer that question, the biggest point I guess I would make is that when you look at Roman history, there are many, many, many times that people are talking about the decline and the, the decline of Rome and then ultimately the fall of Rome. Um, and so Roman history lasts for 2200 years. It starts with a Bronze Age city in uh, the Tiber Valley in what's now the site of the city of Rome. And it ends in Constantinople in 1453 when the Eastern Roman Empire ends because of the conquest of the Turks. And what you see across that entire span of Roman history is stories of decline. Um, but these stories of decline kind of take three different forms. Uh, on the one hand, these declines can be real. Obviously, the state was once a country the size of the United States, and it ends up not existing at all. So there is a real decline. Um, sometimes that decline is real, uh, but sometimes that decline is imagined. And so in Roman history, what we see are uh, in cases when the decline is real, there are two kinds of responses. One is to blame people for causing it. And instead of actually fixing the problem, you attack the other people. Uh, and you use it as a politician to advance your own cause by undermining the rights and privileges, and in some cases, taking the lives of people you disagree with. Um, but in other cases, we see emperors like Marcus Aurelius or the emperor, the Byzantine emperor Leo, uh, focus instead on building society back up uh, and not targeting other people for the problems, but instead finding what everyone can do to move those move society forward and address those issues. Um, but I think the third kind of decline is in some ways the most dangerous. This is the dangerous idea in the title of the book. Um, and that's a decline that doesn't really exist. Um, it's something where there is a change going on in society, uh, but society is not getting noticeably worse. And by any objective measure, you wouldn't look at it and say that the society is getting poorer or less robust or less strong. Um, but you still have politicians capitalizing on the unease that people feel about social change and they then target people they blame for causing that imagined decline. And those are the situations in Roman history that are, I think, the most profoundly destructive because there isn't a problem you're trying to solve aside from the fact that people are uncomfortable. Uh, and so there isn't anything that you actually have to do to make society stronger because society is doing relatively well. Instead, what you're doing is advancing your own interests and targeting other people in society. And I think of those three examples of Roman decline, obviously there are real challenges that the United States is facing. Um, and there are real things that we need to fix. And I think there are people trying to push forward an agenda of bringing society together uh, and trying to address these problems collectively. But there are also people who are fixated on ideas that don't actually um, have anything to do with the real challenges of the economic dislocations of COVID, the virus effects. Instead, they are doing this dance of imagining decline and cynically using it to advance their own interests. And I think we're seeing that in our society as well. And so I think when we look at Roman decline and narratives of Roman decline, we see kind of two things that can help us right now. Um, one is we can identify these cases where people are bringing up imagined decline to try to target other people. Um, and we can also see that there's a very real way to address the challenges that our society is right now facing because of COVID and things like economic inequality, um, environmental challenges. These are real problems. Um, and these are things that we collectively can address. So I think Rome gives us a couple of ways to think about where we are right now. Um, and, and I think it gives us a couple of ways to try to make better the society that we're struggling to kind of bring back from the trauma of 2020. 
uh, you know, the American, obviously, the, the, the modern um, world that we live in today is overlaps with much of the, the rise uh, of of the United States and, and the Americas. Um, but it's, you know, I'm, I was, I'm thinking, okay, well, this isn't the first time that uh, an American politician, Trump is not the first politician to ever blame the others. Uh, Reagan had done so. And in fact, it seems, it's actually very doesn't it seem very normal for American politicians to every few cycles, uh, you know, develop those tactics. I mean, it's so, so I guess, you know, my, my question is, is this something that is a symptom of the decline or part of the decline, or is it just something that's inherent to being a politician? And, and what about, you know, the political systems of today, you know, whether it's the, the flaws in the political systems that we have, our democracy, uh, maybe it's it's money in politics. You know, what about it um, maybe overlaps with Rome that that creates that scenario where the other is is so easy to be pointed out as um, as the problem? Yeah, I think that this is a really good point. So what we see in Rome, um, of course, we all think of Rome as an empire. And for the you know, better part of 1500 years, that's what it is. But before it was an empire, it was a republic. And it was a republic for 500 years. Uh, and what we see in the Roman Republic, um, especially once our, our literary record picks up and we can really trace what people are saying, uh, is a tendency among politicians that we see in our world as well. We're politicians who are looking to take power, run on this, this idea of change, this idea of I can fix the problem that we have. Uh, and there are ways to do that that are really destructive, but there are also ways to do that that are really constructive. So in the United States, I think we, we've seen um, probably the last person who won the presidency doing something other than promising change was George H.W. Bush, you know, almost 40 years ago. Uh, and that was because he was running as the successor of Reagan. But everybody else ran to promise change. Um, but sometimes when they promised that change, um, and I think Obama is a good example of this, mostly Obama was promising to bring us together to move the society forward. You know, to a positive view of change that was supposed to bring everyone together, not red America, not blue America, but America. Uh, and when we saw Trump running in 2016, that was not what he was doing. Instead, what he was doing was running on a platform of change and targeting people. And of course, the famous I mean, the two most famous moments of this are his announcement of his candidacy, blaming immigrants for the problems in society, and then the American carnage speech that was his inaugural. And so I think both Obama and Trump ran on change. Um, and both Obama and Trump embodied this idea that in a representative democracy, it's important to distinguish yourself from what the current conditions are by promising to do something different. Um, but you can do that in a constructive way that brings people together to collectively solve problems, or you can do it in a destructive way that divides society and tries to bring together people to combat each other. Uh, so your partisans are mobilized to combat with the people that you don't agree with. Um, so what factions were at play uh, that, that, I mean, it created the dynamics for the fall of the Roman Empire, separate from the Republic, obviously, which is more democratic. Yeah. Uh, so I think in, well, I think what's actually in some ways most relevant to us is what happens with the Republic. Um, because in the Republic, the factions uh, develop around ideas, especially in the second century BC, ideas that are very familiar to us. Um, and so in the 120s BC, there is a politician named Gaius Gracchus who runs on a platform of change to try to fix the economic conditions of people who are dislocated uh, because of economic inequality and because of a rapidly changing economy that um, benefits the people who understand the new economy far, far, far more than the people who don't understand the new economy. Uh, and what Gaius Gracchus runs on is ideas of providing um, food to Roman citizens in the city of Rome, providing land to people who don't have land and don't have a steady stream of income because they lack that land, uh, and also providing citizenship to a lot of the people from Italy who lived in the city of Rome because it was a great place to work, um, but didn't have citizenship. And what you get is politicians who run from the right and say, in essence, Roman citizenship should mean something. And you might have a terrible condition. Uh, you might not have enough food. You might live in these giant apartments without appropriate sanitation, 
but you're at least better than these other people. Um, and what Gaius Gracchus is promising is extension of citizenship to everyone, which means that that little thing that makes you better than the people around you doesn't exist anymore. And so the response that we get is uh, people running from, in a sense, what we would call Gaius Gracchus' right. Uh, and we get immigrant roundups. We get um, identifications of people who are not supposed to be in Rome. And you get this kind of xenophobia that I think we can identify with. But what that ends up causing is civil unrest. I mean, a generation later, the people who wanted Roman citizenship and didn't get it rebel. It, it becomes so serious that you have political violence around this issue that in the 120s, people were just cynically demagoguing. Um, but this has consequences over time, very serious consequences over time. Uh, and so I think in the Republic, we can see some of the issues that we're struggling with right now, but we can watch them play out over a generation or even a century and see kind of where they go uh, and see that there are moments that you can head this off and you can collectively solve problems uh, that if you don't solve and if you take the opposite tack and you make them issues that people get angry about, it's very hard to solve them and they can be very, very destructive in the long term. When there was this transition from a republic to the empire phase, um, were people aware? I, you, know, I, I, you know, sometimes I feel as if we're not all on the same page about this, <laughs> the state of society. Was it the same back then? Yeah, this is actually an, an incredibly good question because um, we can look at a couple moments in Roman, you know, places where later people place a fall of Rome. I mean, there's so many falls of Rome. But um, if you're in the Renaissance, you're talking to someone like Machiavelli or, or Flavio Biondo, they're saying the fall of Rome was actually, or even Mont Montesquieu, they're saying the fall of Rome was when the Republic fell. Uh, and, and what ends up happening is Rome is so powerful that it has this long kind of afterlife where it's like living on the glory that the Republic built. But the fall of Rome is the end of, of the Republic. But when that actually happened in the city of Rome, everybody knew the Republic ended when Augustus took power. But Augustus frames what he does as emperor as a restoration of the Republic. And so everybody in reality knows the Republic is gone. But the propaganda says the Republic is back. It just has a new form. And Augustus is the kind of caretaker of the Republic, but the Republic is still there. Um, and so in 30 BC, 27 BC, wherever we want to place this, um, this date, uh, what we have is officially the restoration of the Republic. But in reality, everybody knows it's gone. Um, the flip side of this is in the year 476, the date that we are all taught is the fall of the Western Roman Empire. Well, in 476, nobody knew that the coup of Odoacar that overthrew the last Italian Roman emperor reigning in Italy was anything significant. Nobody, nobody thought this was the fall of Rome. The only reason we think that it's the fall of Rome is because uh, in Constantinople, 40 odd years later, they invent this as a fall of Rome to justify the Emperor Justinian's invasion of Italy. Uh, and so with the fall of the Republic in 3027, wherever we want to date it, it's one of these things that officially Rome doesn't fall, but practically everybody acknowledges, everybody knows the Republic is gone. In 476, to us, Officially, this is the fall of Rome, but at the time, not a single person recognized it as the fall of Rome. It's an invented moment of transition. So whereas Augustus invents continuity, Justinian invents uh, the fall of Rome to try to justify violence. But in both cases, they're creating a story that justifies violence that they have done or will do to other people. And how did people buy into it when the the narrative was used as a tool to justify violence? Was it accepted? I mean, he, it, there was no need for, unless I'm you correct me if I'm wrong, there was no need to have democratic approval. It was it, the votes in. It was you could do whatever you wanted, right? Yeah, with Augustus, um, he actually stages elections, but everybody knows how to vote. You know, if you're going to run in that election, you have to have Augustus's approval to run. And there's somebody who tries to run uh, when Augustus has set up this system and he ends up getting, you know, arrested and killed. Uh, so you have the veneer of democracy, but everybody knows what the game is at that point. But I think with Augustus, the, the reason this works is Augustus has 
in the civil wars that precede the creation of the empire, he's killed basically everybody who's going to oppose him. Um, and so you, you know what the deal is. You know that if you oppose this system, you are going to have a big problem. Um, for Justinian, it's more challenging. Justinian also has killed a large number of opponents before he invades Italy. There's a very famous riot in Constantinople in uh, 532 that leads to the burning down of a lot of what's now the area around the Blue Mosque, Hagia Sophia, and Tokapi. Uh, and Justinian um, suppresses this by locking tens of thousands of people in the chariot racing stadium and having archers come in and shoot them. Uh, so Justinian has also gotten rid of a lot of people who disagree with him. Uh, and so when he promotes these ideas, if people do disagree with these ideas, they're being very careful about how they say it. Um, but I think a lot of people who are left in these kinds of societies where you've had this massive bloodletting, they either won't say anything or they genuinely support the person who's actually doing this kind of stuff. Hmm. Sounds very familiar in different ways. Um, how did uh, international opposition, it's not the right term, uh, how, did, how did other powers uh, across the world respond to seeing, you know, what, what, what did they perceive, perceive Roman decline the way that, uh, whether it was Justinian or Augustus, using that rhetoric? Because, you know, I think that I'll only speak from a modern perspective. I was at a conference here in, in the EU a few weeks ago, and it was like the word was not out about the U.S. like saving the EU from. <laughs> but I, I just thought, how different, you know, that the, the, everybody there that was American was like, America's a mess right now. There's no way that that the U.S. can save you from, you know, Orban. And of course, Tucker Carlson, you know, being in Hungary right now, yeah. uh, you know, praising Orban is, is, is a great example of how that's not happening anytime soon coming from us. We're, we're still trying to, you know, fix our democratic elections. So progressives don't get elected. <laughs> that's what we're focused on keeping. It. Um, but I mean, I say that, I say that in just because it's like, we're not all on the same page about yeah. the state of where the U S empire is depending on obviously which world power or alliance you talk to. Was it like that? Um, during the decline over thousands of years, obviously it's a little bit different. It's actually, it's really interesting because there are people who try to take advantage of the situation in Rome to do things to Romans by using this story of Roman decline. So there's a couple of great examples that immediately come to mind. Um, in, uh, in the reign of Justinian, there's actually a Persian king. Um, and so one of the many things Justinian is doing is persecuting pagans. Um, because Justinian feels that as a Christian emperor, everybody in his empire should be Christian. Uh, and the Persian emperor, a man named Kustro, uh, decides that, you know, he's, he's pagan and he's actually very positively inclined towards Greek philosophy. And so there's a group of philosophers who are actually in Athens um, and Justinian closes their school, um, which is the intellectual descendant of Plato's academy. Justinian closes that school and then confiscates their property and says that they will not have full citizen rights unless they legitimately convert to Christianity. And so they go to Persia as refugees uh, and they get uh, asylum from the Persian king. And in a peace treaty that the Persian king negotiates with Justinian, the Persian king demands that they get special protection for their religious rights. Um, and in the war that preceded that peace treaty, the Persian king had invaded what's now Mesopotamia, what's now Iraq and Syria, and had taken territories that had pagan majorities and had said that he is the, the liberator of these pagans from Christian oppression. And so what he's doing is using this story of basically a decline in Roman legal protections for religious minorities as an excuse to fight. Uh, and then he's able to position himself as the protector of those groups in this peace treaty so that if there is a renewed persecution, he has cause to then break the peace treaty and invade again. Um, we later see both Charlemagne and the Fourth Crusade use ideas of religious decline against what we call Byzantium, but, but which everyone at that moment called the Roman Empire. Um, and so Charlemagne says that the reason he can attack well, what is the Eastern Roman Empire um, is because the Empress Irene is reigning as a woman. And because there's no emperor, 
Uh, therefore, there's no empire. Therefore, the title of Roman emperor is vacant. And so Charlemagne takes it. Um, and it's just a but cause. This is all just over a gender thing? Well, at the end of the day? yes, that's officially it. You know, it's, it's, there's wow. a woman in charge. Uh, so, you know, so because there's a woman, we can attack. There's no emperor anymore. Um, and there's a religious component to this as well, but this is what it centers on. Uh, and the, the war doesn't go very well for Charlemagne and he ends up stopping. It doesn't really do very much. Um, but the Fourth Crusade uses a very similar justification for the sack of Constantinople, where they say that the uh, Greek Orthodox Church is basically heretical. Um, the Greeks in Constantinople are not behaving like good Christians and they need to be corrected. And so they attack Constantinople, sack the city. And um, this is the great catastrophe of medieval Greek history. Um, I mean, to this day, this still shapes a lot of the um, a lot of the, the sort of conditions that Greeks live under. It's a very, very significant event that is framed as a narrative of Roman decline and a need for correction from the more orthodox, the more correct, the um, Latin speaking West to come in and fix the decadent Roman Greek speaking East. Fascinating. So, so just for folks who may not, you know, have as much knowledge about uh, Greek Orthodox religion. <laughs> um, what was so? How how was how the Orthodox Church misbehaving? How you know? Because it, I grew up in the Greek Orthodox Church. It's uh, very conservative, and 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 I've been to many other churches, and it's not as conservative <laughs> in modern day. You know the way that we look at it in 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 the modern world. But obviously, there were other things that were dividing um, philosophies that were dividing the churches. So could you just you know highlight some of that and how it relates to today? Yeah, there's a breakdown in the mid part of the 11th century, where um, for a very long time after Justinian invades Italy, the popes lived under um, the Eastern Roman Emperor. And the Eastern Roman Emperor has the power to remove popes and has the power to imprison popes. Doesn't do it very often, but he could if he wanted to. Um, but in the 8th century, the, the popes begin um, asserting their independence a lot more. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that the Eastern Empire really doesn't have the resources to control them. Uh, and so what you get is the popes moving from being under control of Constantinople to being in an alliance with first Charlemagne and then the Western Holy Roman Empire. Uh, and this ends, this leads to a breakdown in um, interactions, church interactions in the 11th century where the Greek Orthodox Church, which is a powerful, you know, it's controlled in the context of the Byzantine Empire, but the Byzantine Empire in the 11th century is a very powerful state. It's probably the most powerful state in the Mediterranean. And so the Greek Orthodox Patriarch doesn't need to work with the Pope. It doesn't need to have great relationships with the Pope because he lives in a state that can protect itself. Um, but the state then suffers some really serious reverses in the later part of the 11th century. And the position of the Greek Orthodox Patriarchy versus the papacy sort of changes. Uh, and the Crusades starts from an appeal that was sent by the Byzantine Emperor um, Alexis Komnenos to have Western military support to fight against the Turks who have taken a lot of territory from the Byzantine state. And that changes the dynamic in a really significant way. So the, the division in the 11th century was between basically two powerful churches that were contesting with one another about spheres of influence. And they're fighting basically as equals. But as you get into the 11th, 12th, later 11th, the 12th and the 13th century, they're not equals anymore. Um, the, the Byzantine state is weaker than what's in the West and the papacy is able to exert increasing pressure on the Greek Orthodox Church because the state that has supported the Greek Orthodox Church is getting weaker. Um, and so the, in a sense, what, what starts as a contest among equals ends up being the West kind of pushing the Greek Orthodox Church. And that makes it perversely a lot harder for them to find any agreement because uh, one is doing in a way violence to the other. This is like completely off topic, um, <laughs> but how did, I mean, in, in terms of, of, of the Roman empire, but I mean, does this relate to you? You think I, the, the, the current, I mean, this is a sort of a reflection. This is still is playing out in, in modern times um, with how the West, you know, treats Southern Europe. Um, in different ways, you know, austerity, et cetera. 
But does this dynamic play into, uh, you think, Russia? Um, Russia, which is aligned with Greece in many different ways, and, and Putin being Russian Orthodox? Is there any sort of overlap there? That's a really interesting question. I mean, I think that from the Greek perspective, this is just a dominant story. Um, one of the things as as a Roman historian who works on the Greek Roman Empire, one of the things that drives me crazy is the fact that this Western story that starts with Charlemagne that says that the Eastern Roman Empire is not Roman, even though they call themselves Romans, even though the state is called by the people living in it, Romania, even though the Greek language as we know it now was called Romaica, even though all of those things were true, the West takes that away from Greeks. Um, And it says that Greeks were not Romans. It takes an identity away from a people. Um, And the modern Greek state, of course, is set up with a German king. It never reclaims that identity. Uh, And so the modern Greek state is, you know, Hellenica. It's a, the, the everything is is Hellenes. It's not Romans, uh, and even in the areas that didn't fall under the control of the modern Greek state, the people still call themselves Romans. I mean, when um, some of the Dodecanese islands are taken over in the 1940s, the people still call themselves Romans. Um, and so, I think that for me, what's particularly striking is this story of Roman decline that starts in the ninth century has actually robbed modern Greece of a very, very important part of Greek history. I mean, a thousand years of Greek history has been taken away. Um, And the contributions that Greeks have made to controlling and protecting and developing the legacy of Rome has all been taken away from them. Um, I think Russia has, uh, under the czars, stepped into some of that void. Um, The idea of Russia and, and Um, Muscovy as the third Rome, is Russia stepping into some of that void. But being the third Rome is different from what you get with the Greeks. I mean, the the Greek experience in the Middle Ages is Roman. This is the Roman Empire. This is the same state that was set up in 753 BC. Um, The Russian state is not. And so with Russia, it's a little more complicated. It's this idea of a kind of translation of empire. But The Roman Empire, based in Constantinople, is the actual Roman Empire. Uh, And what has happened historically is that legacy has been taken away from Greeks um, very unfairly. And it's been done in a way that is um, imperialist and taken from the power source from the West, um, taking a legacy away from Greeks. And I think Russia has capitalized on that, but it's not the same. You know, the Roman legacy is not a Russian story. It's a Greek story. Um, and so the Russians capitalizing that is in some ways not much better than a German king being implanted in Athens in the you know 19th century uh, and taking a legacy and defining a legacy for Greeks when he himself is not Greek. Um, super interesting. Okay, so so I guess just to to, to loop it all back, uh, Comparing uh, the fall of Rome, the, the the long fall of Rome, or the use of of the excuse of the fall of Rome um, as a tactic, you know, where do you think we stand uh, in the Western world today? Uh, let's stick with the United States. Read about you know NATO and the EU and everything else. Um, I think one of the most interesting things that we're seeing is the attempt by Biden in particular to try to build this consensus about how to move society forward and address real problems. Without, identi- without signaling or without targeting people who may have caused those problems. Um, you know, I, I think that there is a way to do this, and Roman history gives us a few examples of this. Um, I think Marcus Aurelius is the best example, where in the, um, the period Marcus is, is emperor, the 160s to about 180 uh, AD, the Roman Empire is hit with smallpox, the series of military challenges. It's, it loses probably 10% of its population, Um, this is a disaster, like a straight on, there is no doubt about it, disaster. But if you read the historians who talk about Marcus Aurelius, who lived through this period, what they say is that this was actually a Roman golden age. Uh, And with the death of Marcus Aurelius, Rome starts to decline. It's very hard to understand how anyone could say that until you start reading what Marcus actually did during that time. Um, What Marcus says he did and what the historians agree he did uh, was to go through Roman, to go through the people in Roman society who could contribute to a restoration of Rome. And what Marcus does is he identifies what they're capable of doing. He doesn't blame them for what they haven't done. 
Instead, he finds tasks that they're capable of doing. He assigns those tasks to those people and he praises them when they do it well. And so what he creates is a sense of a society that is collectively coming together and using its talents in a very strategic way to rebuild after really serious trauma. And I think what Biden is trying to do is that, um, where what he's trying to do is target bad policies, not demonize the people who created those policies, but change the policies and let the people contribute as they're able. Um, it's very hard in our political climate right now to do that. And I think we're seeing some of Biden's frustration really coming out. But I think Biden is trying to do, in a sense, what Marcus tried to do. Um, find ways to bring together everybody who wants to contribute to the restoration of society, identify what they're capable of doing to bring America back together so we can collectively solve our problems, and give us all a sense of pride in making progress um, to address the issues that our society is encountering. Uh, I think we're seeing it's a very hard thing to do. Um, it's very, very hard when a group of people are targeting you to, in a sense, um, look away from that, not respond to that, and instead focus on the contributions, that the positive contributions that people can make, um, and encourage them to make those positive contributions. So I think this would be the lesson that Rome would, would offer to us. I mean, there is a way to take these overlapping disasters that we are experiencing right now um, and make our society stronger but it's really hard to do. Um, and I think we have leadership right now that's trying to do that. Um, I think we have to really hope that it can work. We have to cooperate to the degree that we are invited to participate in this. Um, we have to cooperate with that recovery. But I think the way forward is you know, to focus on bad policies, uh, change the bad policies and get everybody on board in a fashion where we aren't demonizing others. We're instead collaborating and cooperating um, and doing the best we can to solve and address the problems that are around us. Um, and, you know, and I think what Marcus shows is when a society does that, there's a tremendous amount of leeway that's given to leadership. Um, you know, the, the fact that you're trying to do something that positive actually matters even if you can't solve the problems. Marcus doesn't solve smallpox. I mean, the worst of smallpox actually happens in the 190s. But he made people feel like they all have something to do to move that society towards addressing that problem. And that matters. Even if you can't fix the problem, those steps matter in making society stronger. Um, Rome was burning. Don't throw a grenade into it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> It's, it's, I mean, but this is, it. it's like, don't feed the trolls. You don't, there, there's, yeah. we talk this all the time on the left is, is, is how do we make sure that we're not fighting with each other and, and focusing on the bigger crises at hand. And it's very hard because it's, um, we as humans are not, you know, we're, we're not put in for the most part, most of us that are just online are there getting out our, our frustrations. And oftentimes we can feed each other and feed the divisions, but leadership, I mean, I, it's, 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 hard thing, I think, for many of us who probably didn't support Biden um, to just digest and say, OK, he is neutral, trying to neutralize the climate right now that is in the, not the actual climate, but the, the political climate that has been so toxic and continues to be toxic. And and there are folks who make a lot of money and um, get a lot of support by being flamethrowers. And so how do you not engage but neutralize you don't respond and you just, you know, keep calm and carry on, I guess is the best way. And, you know, we still have border camps. So uh, maybe that's yeah. Biden's smallpox and it's not actually a pandemic. Yeah. And, and I think that that's really key. I mean, I don't think, I think Biden is, is a man for this moment. Um, I don't think that this leadership mm. style would have worked in 2008. I don't think it would have worked in 1992. Mm. Um, I, I don't know mm -hmm. that it's going to work now. But it's encouraging to me, at least, to see that I think Biden is doing this deliberately. You know, I, I think that this this policy of being mm. deliberately boring and being deliberately constructive and, and being kind of <laughs> deliberately dull, I think it's actually very, I think he's thought it through. Um, and I think that he has made a Someone decision asked. that this is a way to approach things at this moment. Um, cause this yeah. is what the moment, you know, this is something that can help at that moment, at least in his view. Um, 
And it, I think you're exactly right. It would not have, it wouldn't have worked at other times. Um, when you have other yeah. ways to approach problems or other sorts of problems, this isn't what anyone would have wanted. Um, and it's not even how Biden exactly. ran in the past. I mean, in 88, he's a flamethrower. Um, yep. Yep. So it's, it's, uh, I mean, you can only hope, I guess, uh, he's got a lot on his plate. So if, if, and, and if we, on the, if, if folks on the left have to be the flamethrowers to get him to do things like extend the eviction moratorium and push the CDC to extend it, then maybe that, but, um, you know, he, he does have to adapt the times and the crises as well. So. Really interesting conversation. Um, super <laughs> fascinating. I think we're having a connection issue. I don't know if you can. Can you hear me? Is, I can hear you. is everything okay? Yeah, yeah. It's okay. I just got a uh, a little. I think the meeting just froze, but. No, I'm okay. I can, can hear, hear me. you. Okay. I'm, I'm going to wrap it up if that's okay. I, yeah. I apologize, uh, Professor Watts. Please check out uh, The Eternal Decline and Fall of Rome, The History of a Dangerous Idea. Uh, author Edward J. Watts. We are going to have the link in the description. I'm glad that the sound didn't had a problem at the end and not during the interview, uh, but so far, most of it was great. Thank you so much, Professor Watts. Hope to have you on again soon, and I'll let you know uh, how things go here in Athens with my 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 crusade to <laughs> rediscover democracy and hopefully learn some things and take it back. <laughs> I really, well, that'll be great. That'll be great, and thanks for having me, and um, this was a lot of fun, and I hope we didn't go too far into the, the Greek experience to uh, make it work. But no, I, I enjoyed it. <laughs> it relates. Thank you so much. Plus, plus. <laughs> Take care. Welcome back to the Nomi Key Show. Matthew Cunningham Cook is a contributor to The Intercept as well as The Daily Poster. Uh, he writes about uh, and researches uh, healthcare, retirement policy, and capital markets. But on top of all that, he wrote a piece recently about Senator Nina Turner and the race that happened last night. I'm sure you're all aware of at this point uh, that Senator Nina Turner, former surrogate co-chair of Bernie Sanders' campaign, was running for Congress in Ohio's 11th district and uh, unfortunately did not come in with a win last night, came uh, came in second, of course, uh, and it was a tough race, but we're going to talk about it, what could have potentially happened what went wrong. Uh, I think progressives felt a huge blow last night, but, you know, these congressional races can be complicated. And uh, with the dynamics of people who are really well known and a lot of money coming in on all sides, um, you know, I think there's a lot to assess. So, so Matthew, just first off, thank you for joining us. And, uh, you know, let's, let's, let's assess what happened. Yeah. I mean, I think that uh, I I believe you know, the outside spending uh, by Democratic majority for Israel went up to over three million dollars um, uh, against uh, Nina Turner. Uh, huge influx of cash um, into the race. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, Nina was unable to kind of sustain it um, once that happened. And I think there's, you know, uh, I, I also work in labor, uh, and I will just say, you know, I mean, I think, you know, I'd urge anybody um, listening to, to this right now to check out some of the work of, of uh, Jane McAlevey, um, who wrote a really great friend book. of our show. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, raising expectations and raising hell. I, I mean, she talks a lot about kind of the need for the left to invest in kind of deep organizing, uh, kind of looking at building long-term infrastructure in places. I think that this is kind of a testament um, to some of her ideas uh, in that, um, you know, even if, even if we're able to be financially competitive with, you know, the, the, some of the wealthiest and most powerful people in, in our society, you know, the uh, democratic establishment elite that uh, uh, kind of uh, went all in to stop Nina Turner, unless we have kind of deep um, bases where we're running, where we've developed kind of organizations outside of the democratic party that have um, 
uh, really deep roots in, in working class and impoverished communities were not able to uh, sustain kind of the, the, the attacks by, um, by very uh, wealthy folks like, like Stacey Shusterman, uh, who's kind of one of the main funders of Democratic Majority for Israel, uh, a uh, oil and gas uh, billionaire uh, from Oklahoma. Um, and uh, I, I, I think that um, in particular, one of the things that I've been thinking about is is how much yeah, this money was really able to uh, sway um, higher income households, kind of no matter the race. If I was just looking at it so far, it, it, apparently there's a rough correlation with uh, wards or suburban municipalities with with higher median household income were more likely to vote uh, for Chantel Brown at higher margins. And basically, you know, Nina Turner was unable to uh, turn out sufficient working class and and poor folks uh, to vote for her to make up for this. So that to me is, yeah, you know, I mean, this is, you know, we're, you know, for for progressives, it's uh, being on the receiving end of kind of a very deliberate strategy by the Democratic Party to abandon its working class base, which goes all the way back to Carter. Um, yes. Uh, and but was really amped up under Clinton with NAFTA and then, you know, taken to the next level with Obama, with the foreclosure crisis and uh, and the bailouts and um, uh, and, uh, you know, the the deficit fear mongering. Um, and so, you know, a lot of the what I do think is a lot of kind of the working class fo- and poor folks who turned out to vote for Bernie in 2016 left the party over the next kind of four years. And that's not just, you know, um, uh, white folks, you know, I mean, living in, in West Philadelphia, you know, I can say, you know, uh, the amount of just anecdotally, the amount of black men that I saw uh, kind of voting for Trump was much higher in 2020 than in 2016. Um, and it was made up by, you know, basically wealthy or suburban white women. Or just not uh, showing up to election. Yeah. Yeah. The turnout yeah. was also just yep. St- yep. You know, statistically. Yep. Um, you know, this is, I, I'm really, really happy that you're on talking about this because I read a lot of hot takes today that I vehemently, I mean, um, you know, I, I grew up in outside of Buffalo, New York, very similar to Cleveland, three hours from Cleveland. Um, grew up with, you know, the, the, the steel mills had fall, had had, had uh, closed down, devastated communities. I grew up around, you know, an industrial apocalypse. Essentially, is is was my everyday drive <laughs> to school, um, much like Cleveland and and Philadelphia and Pittsburgh and much of the you know the quote unquote Rust Belt. So what I think is really fascinating about this, and full disclosure, I'm friends with Senator Turner. I've worked with her for many years. Um, but I, I always had a little bit of concern that the nationalization of this race would create, which, which is wonderful when it comes to raising the money and being competitive. The nationalization of the race would would distract away from the type of organizing that you're discussing, which Jane McAlevey, um always talks about, is that, that deep organizing that you know, if you're in a state um, where there's a labor history can be really beneficial to partner with them. She had some labor, so did Brown. Um, So maybe they, you know, canceled each other out or maybe, you know, labor on both different unions didn't show up in the way that they they should have. Um, The way that, you know, labor supported Joe Crowley, but little was done for Joe Crowley. And of course he was confident he was going to win. And all AOC needed to do was turn out 10,000 votes and she did it. Uh, this is a very different scenario. Yeah. My my concern with the hot takes, I've seen two hot takes that I think are not great lessons for progressives. Not great. The first one is, oh, they threw all this money at the race. What did you expect? This is Senator Turner, who is a co-chair for Bernie Sanders. That is without a doubt that was going to happen. So you just go in knowing they're going to throw in millions of dollars and smear you. And then the second is the smears that were used against her were that she was not a loyal Democrat. She had criticized Joe Biden. Um, But we, again, what makes her so popular is that. 
what made her a competitive candidate was that she was anti-establishment. And so you, you can't erase that from her because that is what makes her who she is. So when Sean McAlevey says, oh, well, Democrats, you know, we're, we're starting to see that Democrats, you know, loyal Democrats, you know, most likely to turn out really want to um, see people who are proud of being Democrats. But were those votes ever flippable? Or was it about getting the voters that you're saying, the working class voters who've been disengaged and organizing them more? And I, I'm of the belief, my hot take is at the end of the day, you just needed more working class people to show up because you know what you were getting with the Democratic establishment. You knew they're going to throw you out as being somebody who is not a loyal Democrat. Shocker. You knew, but, 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 you know, she was able to raise the money. I mean, that's the alternative. The money was there. Yeah. This was not an arms race. Yeah. I mean, in the case of Sean, you know, I would just say, you know, if if I ever had a moment with him, I would just beg Sean. I'd be like, Sean, please just spend one week organizing workers with non-majority CW. My former employer is CWA, non-majority CWA public sector workers in Texas or Tennessee or Georgia. See, interact with workers for one day in your life. Uh, and organize workers and hear from organ organ people who organize workers professionally in the South in anti-union environments. And and then and that might kind of affect some of your, you know, hot take analyses of, of the situation. I think Sean does do some valuable stuff, but I I think that there's a lot of arrogance there that's really denuded from any concrete understanding of how working class communities operate or organize. I, I mean, I, w- I would agree with you. I think that um, the press also needs to be a much more responsible in calling up folks who've actually worked on campaigns and in organizing and um, and in polling. <laughs> like yeah. <the> actual posters, <laughs> not <Yeah. laughs> just just a public service announcement. When you yeah. call a pollster, make sure they're a pollster. Yeah. <laughs> just gonna say that. <laughs> um, but you know the, these the the PAC sent out mailers, as our producer Brad says, saying that uh, Senator Turner was against a fifteen dollar minimum wage and against Medicare for all. And of course, the media did not debunk that. But again, we know the playbook now. So what do we do as a movement? I'm more concerned with what are the lessons that we take out of this, and how do we use them moving forward? Because um, someone like a Cory Bush, they knew Cory was coming. She had run many times before, and she was able to out-organize. There were strategies that she used. I mean, even in this, this latest one, fighting the eviction moratorium, uh, fighting for the eviction moratorium. Genius. She, it's like she understands intuitively how power works. Yeah. But do we, as a movement, I mean, did were we too arrogant? Did we think that Senator Turner had it? Uh, I mean, I didn't think so because they started putting so much money into taking her down um, yeah. that they saw that there was room to navigate. But, but, but if we know that they're going to spend millions of dollars in smearing you and doing whatever it takes to, to, to attack you, then what is the alternative? What, how do we outmaneuver, especially with names, um, you know, well-known people who can raise the money to be competitive? Cause that's the reality here. Senator Turner could raise the money to be competitive. Yeah. You know, I mean, so, uh, yeah, the American Prospect uh, commissioned me a few months ago to do uh, a long form look at, at black workers centers um, and kind of the experience. And there's many different black types of black worker centers. A lot of them are kind of more foundation funded. But, you know, my, my favorite is, you know, I mean, there's two that are much more kind of gra- grassroots. Uh, there's one in Mississippi that's headed by Judge Jeroboo Hill. Uh, and then there's one in North Carolina called Black Workers for Justice, which is affiliated with uh, the United Electro- Work- Electrical Workers Union, which endorsed Bernie both times. And that's, you know, the, the experience in North Carolina is really what I would like us to kind of be looking at in the long term, which is, you know, unions and, you know, the Bernie movement coming together, forming kind of worker centers that that. Uh, connect workers with both their rights on their job, their rights in their community, and, you know, ultimately with a path towards unionizing their workplace that's staffed by people who have a real kind of fundamental vision of of political change that's grounded in kind of, you know, the understanding of Bernie's two presidential campaigns, and that's doing kind of long-term organizing, deep organizing. And that, that, to me, is really the direction that that I would love it if we we could go out of this is you know I think yeah it's it's too easy 
You know, I, we joke in labor organizing, you know, when we're working with, with a committee, you know, which is, you know, the job of the organ, the committee wants to do everything but talk to other workers. <laughs> the job of the organizer is to make the committee go and talk to other workers uh, because of talking to other workers is really hard and really difficult and you experience rejection and you experience painful conversations, but it's the only way that you're able to build power. I, I hear, hear, um, sad day for many people, but an extraordinary moment for us to be introspective and learn because I think folks were really shocked. Um, yeah. and you know, it's the toolkit has been there. <laughs> it's always been there, right? The tactics are the same. The, the, they're using the same tactics they used, you know, in the industrial era, they use, they, they've been using the same tactics over and over. Yeah. And, and our tactics yeah. are the same too. <laughs> and the other thing I, I want to just say is, you know, I mean, I, I, I said this last night on Twitter, you know, but it's, you know, I mean, the, the American left, which has brought this country reconstruction, you know, the first time in world history when, when bonded people were freed without compensation, which brought the world May Day came, comes from the U S which brought which created the the CIO, which organized the industrial working class in the heart of capitalism. I mean, we've accomplished great things as a movement, but it's surrounded by catastrophic defeats, one after another, far more catastrophic than this, you know? Um, uh, thousands of labor organizers beaten, murdered. That's right. Uh, you know, uh, thousands of civil rights workers beaten, murdered. You know, the the killing fields of Gettysburg. You know, this is, you know, and it's always, I think it's always worth kind of reflecting on kind of losses like this is that, you know, we're still here. You know, yeah. the, the seeds are still there, you know. And so the question is, you know, I mean, how do we how do we grow a garden out of what we have? Beautiful words to end end with. Matthew, thank you. Thank you for inspiring us. Quick little lesson. That was great. That was a great pep talk. Oh, wow. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Matthew Cunningham Cook, appreciate you and your work and hope to have you back on soon. We can, con I'm, I'm going to guess this isn't going to stop. So we'll just uh, pick up from where we left off well, next time. Great. Thanks, Namiki. Welcome back to the Nomi Key Show. Well, 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 uh, Sunset Lake CBE. Yeah, you know it. I was on um, I was on Twitter yesterday and there were all these like CBD memes. I don't know if you guys, I'm not like a meme person. I'm, I don't go on the meme, you know, the accounts. Um, but there's like a CBD meme running around and I just <laughs> started putting in response to Sunset Lake CBD because if someone's going to try CBD, they better try Sunset Lake CBD. Why? That was a really bad explanation, but I'll find a meme and I'll post it so you guys know what I'm talking about because that was just a random... <laughs> I didn't think this through, okay? Um, there are CBD memes. I don't know if you know about that. So with that being said, I have tried other CBDs, did not like them, thought it was a gimmick. Turns out uh, when you get a good CBD, it's not a gimmick. And of course, Sunset Lake CBD is the best because they are very serious about what they're doing. Uh, they have taken a farm, a Ben and Jerry's farm, couldn't get more progressive juju, better progressive juju than that for that farm. They flipped a Ben and Jerry's farm in Vermont and they turned it into a hemp farm, a premium hemp farm, uh, diversifying the farm uh, to create the products that Sunset Lake CBD ships directly from their farmer owned, uh, co it's, it's a co-op, I think that's, that's the proper way of saying it, I guess, Brad, I don't know, um, where the employees own the majority of the company and they pay their employees a minimum $15 minimum wage. And on top of all that, they support independent media like our show, like the majority report and the David Packman show, and they will ship all of their products to your door, all types of products, including, uh, they've got dog biscuits. That's the new one, which has peanut butter and pumpkin and oat flour, um, and your dogs will love it and it'll chill them out because my dog's crazy. And so it definitely chills them out a little bit. Uh, but they also have salves, they have tinctures, they have fudge, uh, they have lotion, and they have hemp, of course, as well. Um, so that you can, Dorsey likes to make fun of me for saying this, smoke your hemp. Uh, I love, I love all their products. I really love their gummies. 
but I was eating too many of them. I would basically eat a half a bottle at once. <laughs> That's not a good thing to do. Um, but I love their salve, you know, for so many different reasons. I get like rashes on my arms. And so it really helps calm it down because there's arnica in it. Uh, I love the tinctures. The tinctures are amazing for anything from having a deep sleep to helping you out when I have a migraine. I also will smoke the hemp when I have a, high, a migraine. And like within three minutes, my migraines will go away. So I love Sunset Lake CBD. If you love Sunset Lake CBD and you would like to buy their products, you get 20% off of your entire order if you go to sunsetlakecbd.com and type in know me in the promo code N-O-M-I and you get 20% off of your entire order, sunsetlakecbd.com. All right, welcome back to the Nomi Key Show. We've got our dear friend, Napoleon the Legend. He is an Afrobeat hip hop artist. Love Napoleon. How you doing, Napoleon? It's been a while. Well, doing great. Good to see you. Good to see you too. And Julia Doubleday is deputy director of committee. Uh, she is always on the committee program every week, which airs here at 3 p.m. on Mondays, 3 p.m. Eastern. Uh, she was also the campaign manager for Julie Oliver's congressional campaign in Texas 25th district. And of course she was over at Bernie Sanders and Beto Rourke's uh, 2018 campaign. We should say not the presidential campaign. That was a dumpster Senate, fire. Of Senate race. <laughs> race, if I can say. Yes. The Senate, the, the good one, not the, not the one where everyone. The like, Ted really? Cruz race. Yeah. That was yes. the one. That's why we have you. Cause, Cause you do good <laughs> things. All right. Um, I want to start off with what, is really an incredible uh, use of organizing and media. And that is, of course, Congresswoman Cori Bush has been fighting against the, leading the charge against the eviction, um, in extending the eviction moratorium, which I don't know, seems like it should just be something you should think about when a bunch of people were forced to stay home and not work for months during a lockdown and then had to pay the same rent, even though rents are going down now. It just, just, it just, it just seems to make sense. And if you're like Joe Biden, you wouldn't want to have like Biden bills and as, as like Hoover bills, you'd, you'd like kind of want to make sure that, that the homeless crisis was at least stabilized. Uh, you know, it's bad as it is. It's just, I don't know. That's just called like politics 101 maybe, but no, no, no. Cory Bush being who she is and somebody who has been unhoused. Um, and she's been destigmatizing that experience because I think there are far more people that have been evicted than we are even aware of and who have been unhoused. And she has done a great job, great public service destigmatizing it, but also leading this charge and um, taking a stand and calling attention. So I want to play this clip of Congresswoman uh, Cory Bush. Let's play the first one, Brad. The White House issued a reversal on evictions after a member of Congress camped out for days on the steps of the Capitol. On Tuesday, the White House authorized the CDC to issue new eviction moratorium that would prevent millions of renters from being kicked out of their homes. The new ban covers 90 percent of where the country lives and areas with, quote, substantial and high levels of coronavirus transmissions. Missouri Congresswoman Cori Bush, a progressive Democrat who has dealt with homelessness herself, slept for days on the steps of the Capitol to urge the White House to act. Hopeful that it is what will help 11 million people stay in their homes, 6 million families to be secure in housing. And let me say, uh, activists are in Congress. So let's be clear. Activists are in Congress. So expect expect for things to be different than what maybe people are used to. Napoleon. Uh, I think it's wrong. From Congress. <laughs> go for it. Go for it. Go for it. I'm jumping. No, God. no, I just, I just go, thought go. it was awesome. <laughs> I mean, it's it's so it's so refreshing to see that. And, you know, in, in a day and age where the news cycle is so um, dramatically bad, negative, you know, and, and it's saddening. This is actually like a, a spark of light somewhere to know that there's somebody that's actually doing their job at the, uh, as a politician. They're promising one thing when they to, to get elected. They're running on a mandate and they're coming there and they're putting themselves, their bodies on the line and, and they're putting their money where their mouth is. And it, it's beautiful to see. And on the flip side, 
I don't want to say, but it's sad that we have to go to these lengths for these for people to care that people you know don't get knocked off on the street without nothing to do in 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 a, in a during a pandemic during crisis so it's like it, it exposes like the, the 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 flaws of the system at the same time and it shows that there's other ways to do things so i'm i'm so happy that she's bringing activism into the mix also it was i think it was really creative i mean i think sometimes julie i mean you've been organizing for a long time sometimes we get into these um repeated patterns of types of organizing and and sometimes we don't realize it is not working like it's great to show up and and uh march on the streets but you know it doesn't always work um so i feel like she she really refreshed it she refreshed the game quite a bit um but as napoleon says uh, it's a shame that you have to go to these lengths but also like juxtapose that with the fact that kirsten cinema was like hi guys i have to go and do a wine tour during my vacation um and hold up government so like the juxtaposition of cory bush and and Kirsten Cinema is, is pretty amazing as well. So I don't know, Julia, what, what do you think? Like, are we as getting more activists in Congress who have these refreshing tactics? Is, is that what's going to work? I think this really highlights the importance of a diversity of tactics. So, I mean, you always have this sort of um, eternal battle on the left that's do we work within the system or do we work outside of the system? And I think people on both sides of that argument have really good points and they have good uh, reasons for feeling the way they do about working inside and outside the system. Um, but I think what you see here is that someone is doing both and doing both really successfully and actually using that foot that she has in the door to be able to sort of hold it open um, to more of that sort of outside the establishment organizing. So it's this really powerful combination. I'll also say I really like that she's you know referring to herself as an activist talking with activists, being on the ground, just speaking to normal people. I think that it really says a lot about politicians, how they treat activists, because in my experience, there's two types of activists or two types of politicians, one that loves activists and thinks that they do good work and that they help to push causes forward. And another that just thinks they're crazy people and they're a pain in the ass. I would put like Hillary Clinton in that category because we know that she privately talked about how the um, keeping in the ground protesters need to quote unquote, get a life. Um, that kind of treatment to your constituents when they're the ones that, you know, are supposed to be your boss, they put you there. Um, it's just so arrogant and it's so detached from the way a democratic system is supposed to function. So, I mean, to your point, Napoleon, I think that this still doesn't go far enough and it is, unfortunate that we're so far off the mark of where we should be with this pandemic, um, not to get too far down that road, but essentially like if we would have had a real lockdown in March of 2020, and if it would have been a harshly enforced, you know, six week lockdown, then we could have embraced an elimination strategy and this would have been behind us a year and a half ago. But that was too expensive. They didn't want to pay people to stay home for six weeks. And now we're dealing with the fallout from that. And we're going to be potentially for the rest of our lives. I mean, I'm not exaggerating. Uh, this virus is not going anywhere at this point. And our vaccines are not keeping pace with it. One, because people, some people won't take them. But even more importantly, uh, many people, most people can't get them. So it's a man-made crisis and just like most of the other crises we're dealing with. Um, so I'm very glad that we have these fighters in Congress, but uh, it's going to, it's going to be a lot more work continually. You know, I, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned this because the, it is a man-made crisis. I mean, there are funds that were actually allocated to, to support renters that are not being used. And this is the stuff that just doesn't make sense to me. You know, whether it's Joe Biden eliminating uh, student debt that federal student debt that he could do and it doesn't cost, it's it's literally like, there's no reason not to do it. Like he could do it with a signature and it doesn't affect the economy at all. It doesn't affect debt. It's there. The money's there. I don't understand these things because what this pandemic has exposed to us in this economy is that there are things that the government is not doing that they can do and it's not going to cost them anything. And I don't even think it politically costs them anything. So I can't understand why they're not doing it. So I, I want to play this clip really quick because I, my jaw dropped when I learned about this. I wasn't even aware. 
On Monday, CNN showed you a Las Vegas mother facing eviction after she lost her oh, no, job when the pandemic. Sorry, Brad, the eviction allocation of money. Let's roll the clip. All good. Since Friday, Missouri Congresswoman Cori Bush has camped out on the steps of the U.S. Capitol to raise awareness. We are hopeful that it is what will help 11 million people stay in their homes. House Democrats say Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen told them on a call Tuesday that her department is working hard to help cities and states distribute more of the $46 billion in emergency rental assistance that's already been approved by Congress. In some communities, program administrators are creating unnecessarily complicated applications with burdensome documentation requirements. The National Low Income Housing Coalition says millions of Americans behind on their rent are still waiting for help. The National Apartment Association says small property owners and independent rental owners are hurting too. This has gone on for such a long period of time. We're over a year now and people's savings are being depleted in a dramatic way. Advocates say it could take weeks or even months for the federal aid to be distributed. Natalie Brand, CBS News, Capitol Hill. Only three of the $46 billion in rental assistance had been distributed through the end of June. The National Low Income Housing Coalition says while some states have made the application process too complicated, others are struggling with capacity and they don't have enough, enough staff to handle all of the applications. If you need help, just go to our website, cbsdfw.com. We've got links where you can turn for assistance. Three of the $46 billion has been allocated. You know, I, I would love to be like, oh, this is because it's, 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 you know, we're creating bureaucracy. But I don't know if you guys have ever been to the EU, Napoleon, <laughs> you have. It is, I mean, they're like, they're like the, the, the EU is like, they're masters of bureaucracy and they were able to disperse funds. Uh, we know a friend of the show, Aran Chowdhury, was getting like, soccer after school program funds for his kids from the government because they wanted to make sure that kids were so what is going on when we need to get funds in the door we know there are ways there are ways what is these just excuses what is i can't understand i just don't get it feel free who wants I mean, to chime to, in? Go for it. I'm just to, to your yeah. point. We we all, I mean, we all have uh, stimulus checks, and they came in fine. Like that was like the first time I get. I mean, in my lifetime, I, I've received anything like that. So obviously, there's a system for them to give people money through their bank accounts. Uh, so I, I I feel like it's an excuse. Oh, I don't know. Or uh, since we're so not used to doing social type things, maybe it's like that's the learning curve where it's like, OK, we need to get on the ball to be able to, like, provide help that's allocated for the people to the people. It's it's pretty embarrassing to me. Like when, when you think about it, when you look at it. Yeah. If we want to talk about, like, what is the function well, Julia, of a government? I mean, oh, good. Good. Go if ahead, we want to talk ahead. about what is the function of a government, like, why should it exist? Why does a government exist? I mean, uh, essentially the concept is we're all going to get together and make rules for ourselves that create a fair and safe society for everyone and um, ensure that we're all, you know, able to get what we need. Like that's the idea of having some sort of centralized organization for society. Right. Um, and it seems that right now our government can't perform any of those essential functions. The only thing we're really capable of doing is spending billions of dollars on the war machine and giving corporate actors um, handouts. So I think you can see this as well when it comes to like, you know, early on in the pandemic, we were seeing in other countries that actually handled the first outbreak well, like New Zealand and South Korea. Like if you, you if you were to go to South Korea, there was an extensive testing process. They would house you. They would send you, you know, make sure that you had food for the course of your quarantine. They would test you twice before you were allowed to mingle with other people. And it was this large process. And the whole time I'm sort of advocating, like, why aren't we doing anything like this? On the other hand, I don't even think that our government is capable of doing that. I think that, quite frankly, like, it's so it's become 
because of years and years of neoliberal reforms, it's become so um, just weakened and privatized. I mean, every function goes to some private contractor that charges 10 times what it should actually cost. Um, and then they come up with solutions that aren't um, cleared through or coordinated with other private actors. So we get this like really patchwork piecemeal complete mess. I mean, we saw in like Philadelphia, there were some kids that like knew people that got like the contract to, um, do COVID testing, I think, or maybe it was distribute vaccines, but either way it was like, if we don't have any sort of, um, national functional services, um, that can coordinate with each other, then we're not able to perform the basic functions of governance. And I don't think that the United States right now is able to perform any basic functions of governance from what I can tell. That's right. And, and it's, it's interesting you say this because there's, there's this, it's not that there are like these two philosophies. There's one that thinks that like, okay, we're going to make money off of the failure of the state, the failure of the state that we have created because we've imposed austerity, because we've uh, failed to to modernize our, our our systems of government governance, whether it's you know our operations. I mean, it, the Obamacare rollout is like a beautiful example. We defended Obama right as much as we could because we believe in a better healthcare system, and obviously it's nowhere near where it needed to be. But it was a disgusting failure in terms of how it was operationalized and it was embarrassing because, you know, this was the, the technocratic <laughs> government, right? That could have like handled a website, right? Or the uh, the Solyndra scandal. I mean, these were like examples of how Democrats were just proving the Republican talking points. But what I see here is I'm just trying to think of like, okay, well, what this, this is not a good look. Like in times of crisis like this, this is where these philosophical conversations about whether or not we want to have a strong state or not or privatized, they, they really come to head. This is this is where like people start to see it, they start to feel it. And it is our duty as progressives and, and hopefully Democrats to really make the case as to why the state is here to save you. It's not, it's not some private actor who's spending all their you know billions of dollars to go to space. Um, with that being said, no one's spending any money on this. And my thought on this is this is just some sort of horrible disaster capitalism in which um, hedge funds are going to seize up you know, mid-level apartment complexes. Um, they're going to clear out people, raise the rents, do what they've done in New York, you know, multiple times over and over, but they're just going to do it in a national way. The concern is where do people go? You know, we all know how hard it is to, to, to be able to apply for rent in a major city in America. You have to show, you know, proof of, of, of good credit. You have to show proof of, um, Having uh, having a, a revenue income that is an income that is multiple times what the rent is that month, and like in this economy, that's that's not even possible. So, who's going to end up being you know the renters now? It's 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 the wealthy. Um, if you're not already a landowner, so it's just I don't understand how this ends well. Like how any economist, even a conservative economist, can see this boding well for the wealthy. I well, really I don't. I think you have like this underlying. People have nowhere to live. You can't rent. Where do they go? I think um, you know you're hitting on a larger issue with the modern economic system, which is just that it doesn't have the ability to not destroy itself in the long term. I mean, you might as well ask the same question about climate change. It's like, well, if you make the only habitable planet unlivable, where are you going to live? And that just doesn't register with these people because I think the people who are benefiting, they're so used to getting their own way that they can't imagine a scenario where things don't just work out for them. I mean, that's something that actually bothers me a little bit about the climate conversation is that what we'll hear over and over and over again is that, well, yes, it's really terrifying, but you can't really talk about it because you're going to panic people and they're going to feel negative and they're going to feel bad. And if they feel bad, then they're not going to want to do anything. And I disagree with that because let me tell you something, we haven't been making them feel bad and they're not doing anything. So like, they're not doing anything. They, they probably should be a little bit more scared than they are now. I don't give a shit if we scare them because I think everybody should be scared about what's happening. That doesn't mean you can't do something productive, but this attitude of like, hope, change, rainbows, flowers, it's all just going to work out because technology or because we're coming together. No, it's not. 
We need really, 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 really radical change. And I think the only way these people are going to, by these people, I basically mean um, the richest people in the world. I think that the only way they're going to understand that is if they understand their consequences for themselves. They don't understand that when it comes to climate change. They don't understand that apparently when it comes to the vaccine. They don't understand that when it comes to evictions. I mean, you always hear rich people complaining that they have to rest their eyes on a homeless person, right? Like that's a big issue is that like, I saw a homeless person, this is a problem. And the solution is never like, maybe that person should be in a house. And then I wouldn't have my horrible problem of my eyes seeing a person that's living on the street. Um, so all of these problems, um, they're very, very entrenched. And I feel like the people who are maintaining these systems just have no capacity to understand long-term effects. I mean, another example, and I'll turn it back over to you, but another example is what I was talking about the last time on, I was on the show, which is this investment in water and investment in agricultural commodities, this idea of like, well, I'm going to um, make money because water is becoming scarce. How is that going to turn out well for you? Like water becoming scarce is going to be good? No. Why don't we address, like fix this problem instead of investing money in the idea of people not having water like that's crazy well i i think that it's also an issue of like having having um restrictions to the system because people people by themselves if they're gonna benefit they don't care like if they could get a, a mansion or a yacht off something that's enough to them they could care less what happens behind that you, you know one million dollars for for somebody or 50 or whatever is is enough for them to not care. And, and and I think the problem lies is like we have to protect people against their own arrogance because these people, once they reach a certain level, they have this arrogance that they're better and everything's going to be OK because they're just it's just short, short term, short term. And um, I don't know if it's through taxing, wh whether it's just more centralized control of everything to be like, look, uh, th this is unacceptable. I, I just don't think you could expect people to do the right thing, <laughs> like almost, especially the people that have the power, that have the the, the means to produce, that have that own the land. I, I just don't think most people. Some people will do the right thing. I just don't think it's humanly that the, 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 they're not wired like that, or they haven't been wired like that. You know, it's interesting. Right before you said that, Napoleon, I was thinking we need to pit some of the more quote unquote patriotic billionaires against use them as the weapons. You know, they're going to respond to the masses. Like, unless we're, we're coming to their gates and we're ready to burn down their, you know, their, their yachts or whatever, um, they're not scared. But you know what they are scared of? Having their peers call them out. So if, if Warren Buff Buffett likes to call himself this a humble billionaire, you know, and, and, you know, fair enough, he does, he, he, he does, I guess he his, he he articulates a, tip, a different type of being a billionaire. He doesn't, you know, his kids and his grandkids don't get money automatically. I don't, I don't know, but it's like it's different, right? But if he's going to do that, why not call out the other billionaires who are invested in his companies, who he's invested in? I mean, they all mingle with each other. They all invest with each other. They all see each other at conferences. They all know each other. They probably all hate each other. Their wives probably all hate each other. And and their ex-wives, obviously, <laughs> like I love the Melinda Gates and and uh, uh, um. Uh, what's her name? Uh, uh, Jeff Bezos' ex-wife. Uh, I love that they're, 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 you know, getting together. Um, but I say this like, this is not a joke. You have to use the peers against them. So if there are billionaires who are giving more money to progressive causes because they actually feel like that's what makes them human, use them against them. I mean, I mean, that's really what it is. If, if Warren Buffett says he wants to give all this money away, then why not pay more taxes? Why not call out your colleagues for not paying taxes and how the entire the civilization is 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 spiraling out of control and is in decline because Jeff Bezos doesn't want to pay one percent tax. I, yeah, and I don't think McKenzie we can. Scott, that's we, I don't think we can rely on them to really do anything. I liked, you know, Napoleon, he used the word arrogance. I think there's this really. um over the top arrogance and hubris that you see in people like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk um, with this space obsession. I mean, that is like the most hubristic thing I can possibly think of. It's like they have no concept of how much work and labor would need to go into even keeping one person alive in space for 10 minutes, which is like all they've really done so far. And it costs, you know, however many millions of dollars. Um, 
this idea that like, hey, you know, I'm basically God. We can just destroy this planet and I'll just make a new planet. You can't do that. Like, I'm sorry, Elon Musk, like you're not going to be able to turn Mars into Earth. If you look at, um, you know, <laughs> people say like, oh, the problem with socialism is eventually run out of other people's money. The problem with capitalism is eventually run out of other people's labor and their resources. And if you look at where the value in capitalism comes from, it comes from people's labor. And then like 75% of it comes from natural resources, natural inputs, things that were, you know, God given on the planet for all of us. That's what creates the profit. That's what creates the value that these people derive. So they think they're going to go to Mars and somehow turn that into some sort of profitable enterprise. Like, the amount of money it would cost just to have one person live there, you could, you know, presumably do a lot more to save this planet and it would make a lot more sense. So, I mean, like that arrogance and that hubris of the idea of like, I can move to Mars, it's just totally delusional. I mean, these people shouldn't be in charge of anything. We need a billionaire whisperer, but it's just I just feel like even Bill Gates, when he he he, he talks about, you know, or, or donates to progressives cost, I, I feel like it's cosplay. You know what I mean? It's just his way of just just branding himself that way to make some more money and make his legacy look better. Well, it's also like, you know, charity is so um, much a part of capitalism. So it's not about redistribution. It's just about um, a little bit a little bit of PR, a little bit of a massage for people to, you know, not chase them out of their house with pitchforks. With, with that being said, there are absolutely, um, I mean, it is, it is a washing away of, of guilt, whatever it is, but there are legitimately some wealthy people out there who, you know, Soros, for instance, who put a lot of money into organizing and, democracy reforms and things that, I mean, the working families party, for instance, you know, you'd be, it would be hard to say, but of course, the working families party has had huge, huge successes. There's a lot of money that comes from Soros who makes his money in really questionable places. Um, you know, using someone like that to vocally call out a Jeff Bezos. I mean, there are divisions or are the way that they love to divide us. We have to start dividing them. That's basically all I'm saying. There are people who are in that class that are more receptive to the criticisms. Um, and maybe it starts with Mackenzie Scott and uh, and Melinda Gates. Maybe that's it. I don't know. My, my dad's a lawyer and he used to always say, always be careful when people are going through divorces. They're vulnerable to a lot of work. Yeah, I mean, I think ultimately <laughs> there are billionaires who are more amenab- amenable to giving to charity and there are billionaires that are more amenable to one cause or another. But the issue and the problem is that, like, there are these people with this ability to dictate what's going to happen to the rest of us. Um, And ideally, you know, that sort of inequality wouldn't even exist in the first place. You know, we talk about redistribution. We got to take the money away from them and give it to the rest of us. But there's already been a massive redistribution of wealth and it comes from the people and it comes from their labor and it's redistributed to the richest people. So maybe we need to reframe that as just sort of like the return of resources to the public. Um, you know, right now, people who, have, resources. people who have that kind of power, even if they're using it in a way I agree with, I still don't think that they should have that kind of power. Um, and a lot of these problems, I mean, if we could go back to talking about the eviction moratorium, it's like, there's these underlying issues of like, well, why is it that this became a crisis so quickly when like the average person in America doesn't have $400 in savings? That's why it became a crisis. So this wouldn't have even been this gigantic issue if we had a society that was like sustaining people. You know, people could have stayed home for six weeks if that sort of middle-class American dream was actually a thing and people actually had homes and savings um, and they weren't living paycheck to paycheck. Yep. That was the one part of that uh, clip that we shared where they're saying people are running through their savings. It's been like 18 months. And people ran through their savings. Oh, that was 17 the, months that ago. was the that was the landlord guy. He wanted us to feel bad for oh, yeah. landlords. And I think he was <laughs> saying, like, they're almost out of savings now because you know, <laughs> okay, well. <laughs> okay. Uh, Napoleon the Legend, Julie Doubleday, thank you so much for joining us today on the show. We love you. We appreciate you. Stay safe, be well, wear your mask, you know the jam. Um, I can't believe we have to say that again, but yes, wear your masks. Yeah. Take care.
Thanks for having Thank me. Thank you, everybody, Thank for you. watching today. Appreciate you. We will be back on Friday, same time, same place. It's Fem Friday. Uh, you definitely want to check it out. And if you haven't already, go check out the committee program, which aired on Monday. You can watch it. And, uh, it it's, it's, it's in the archives. You know, it's only like an episode behind. So go check out the committee program with Ren Chowdhury and Julia Doubleday. We appreciate you. Stay in solidarity and be well. The No Mickey Show. Clash momentarily for class solidarity. Cash circulating, give the masses back its currency. Greed from elites, oligarchs stay fed. Deep state, faith fed. Everybody break bread. Racism, homophobia, sexism, religion in this melted pot. We live in time to build a new system. Unionize labor rights. Highlight the issue. Talking heads left is best. The saga continues. Continues. The No Miki Show. Continue.